In this episode, I shall elaborate evidences available all over India which confirms the phenomena of the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities. Evidences suggest that 10,000 years ago, Pali and Prakrita speaking Indian origin fraternities spread to Palistan, now Palestine, on the Mediterranean coast. Similarly, 6,000 years ago, Sanskrit speaking Indian origin fraternities spread to Eastern Europe. Between 4,000 and 2,000 years ago, Indian origin fraternities returned to India for various reasons. Though Indian origin fraternities returned from both Egypt and Europe, but the reverse migration of the Sanskrit-speaking Indian origin fraternity from Europe is popularly referred to as the Indo-Aryan invasion. Though Indo-Aryan invasion is considered as a primary migration of Aryans from the West into India, but it was actually a reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities back to India. Namaste. Welcome to Sangam Talks. This particular episode will be the third one in the series India and Egypt. So we strongly recommend you all to first go and check out the previous two episodes in the series India and Egypt by Dr. Tilak Ranjan Bera Ji. Dr. Bera has explored Indian subcontinent to collect evidences to establish the antiquity of Indian civilization. He introduced quite a few never thought of ideas to arrange Indian history. He was awarded Fulbright Fellowship and went to the Yale University. In this particular episode, Dr. Bera is going to uh, bring in some groundbreaking evidences in order to establish unconventional ways to establish that Aryans were indeed reverse migrating Indians. I know it is very exciting. So without any further ado, I would directly like to hand it over to Dr. Bera to take it forward from here. Hello, everyone. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude to Sangam Talks for giving me this platform and an opportunity to discuss about the pre-recorded period of India and that of the world. As I have discussed in my previous lectures, I have authored a book titled India in Egypt. This book establishes an intense connectivity between Indian and the Egyptian civilization. In fact, evidences strongly suggest that Egyptian civilization was developed by the Indian origin people. This concept may appear unbelievable at this stage because our history textbooks do not talk about this. It is evident that our civilization is extremely old and major part of those events occurred during the pre-recorded period. There is a need to study our ground evidences extensively and arrange the events of our pre-recorded period or prehistorical period accommodating those evidences. For whatever reason, our history is totally indifferent to these and present a narrative which does not go with the available ground evidences. This possibly happened because our history was dictated by the foreign rulers who presented the narrative keeping their interest in mind. They got an opportunity to establish the Indo-Aryan invasion hypothesis and that the Europeans introduced refined civilization in India. Evidences suggesting existence of a very advanced ancient civilization Civilization prior to Indo-Aryan Indo arrival in India was carefully suppressed. Moreover, recorded evidences extends for at the most about 2,500 years. Clearly, our civilization is much older than that. In fact, a number of detectable evidences clearly establish that Indian civilization is extremely old. But just because we cannot support this with scripted documents, we are unable to establish the exact antiquity of our civilization. An extensive exploration of the Indian subcontinent is absolutely important to understand the prescript period of India. Archaeological evidences now claim that India had a refined civilization 10,000 years ago. Archaeological sites of Mehergarh, Rakhigadi, Gulf of Kambat cultural complex, Virana, Laura Deva have confirmed the antiquity of Indian civilization. In fact, there are other glaring evidences as well. Rig Veda is accepted as the world's oldest scripture. Sanskrit and Tamil are considered as two of the oldest languages of the world. A very refined philosophy was propagated by Gautama Buddha 2500 years ago, which establishes that Indian philosophy had attained such intellectual refinement during those early period. Sanatana Dharma of India is certainly much, much more older than that. 
During that same period, major parts of Europe were inhabited by primitive men fighting with one another, trying to occupy others' land. Clearly, Indian civilization was much ahead of others in terms of intellectual refinement. But in spite of having such clear evidences, Indian civilization is not considered as the oldest civilization of the world. Interestingly, available recent genetic data suggests that post-glacial period genetic identities like R1 alpha and R1 Bravo originated in India. Obviously, if they had spread from India 10,000 years ago or more, they had also spread Indian knowledge, language, and culture. Hence, it is highly possible that other ancient civilizations of the world were established by Indian origin people. We Indians have to make an effort to write our own history independent of others or under any Western influence. After all, we are discussing evidences which are present in India and making an effort to arrange them in a scientific manner. This is the right time to take this initiative because in the last two or three decades, a lot of scientific data have emerged which favors the hypothesis that Indian civilization is much older than what we presently think of it. This concept is difficult to establish at present with the kind of syllabus we have, which is heavily influenced by Western ideas, establishing their superiority. However, we have to make an effort against all odds and I'm trying to initiate the process. Presently, antiquity of the Indian civilization is little understood because Several major events which occurred in India during the last 10,000 years or during the post-glacial period are not taken into consideration. Ground evidences are ignored altogether and are thus completely missing from the narrative of our history. Many of these events occurred at an earlier period when scripts were not available. It took me 20 years of extensive exploration of every corner of the Indian subcontinent to collect evidences. It was a marathon exercise to arrange the events in the right sequence to understand the entire process. I've authored a number of books documenting my experience of exploration as it is important to establish a new narrative backed by authentic evidences. To arrange the prehistorical period in the right sequence, I have introduced a number of new subjects in my book India in Egypt based on ground evidences. In a previous episode upload, uploaded by Sangam Talks, I have discussed that Onward migration of Indian origin fraternities adopted animal symbols like Naga or serpent, mean or fish, bag or tiger, Hanuman or monkey, avian, turtle, elephant and so on as their ethnic symbols. It appears that the Indian origin people had traveled to the Mediterranean coast about 10,000 years ago with their language and culture and thereafter to Egypt and Greece. At a later date, they returned to India en masse due to different reasons for the and this process took a long period of time. This is referred to as the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities in this book. As I explored the Himalayan region, I could gather definite evidences of the land route reverse migration of Indian origin people. In this episode, I shall elaborate evidences available all over India which confirms the phenomena of the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities. Evidences suggest that 10,000 years ago, Pali and Prakrita speaking Indian origin fraternities spread to Palestine, now Palestine, on the Mediterranean coast. Similarly, 6,000 years ago, Sanskrit-speaking Indian origin fraternity spread to Eastern Europe. Between 4,000 and 2,000 years ago, Indian origin fraternities returned to India for various reasons. Though Indian origin fraternities returned from both Egypt and Europe, but the reverse migration of the Sanskrit-speaking Indian origin fraternity from Europe is popularly referred to as the Indo-Aryan invasion. Though Indo-Aryan invasion is considered as a primary migration of Aryans from the West into India, but it was actually a reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities back to India. On the other hand, reverse migration of Indian origin Pali and Prakrita speaking fraternities from the Red Sea region remains completely undetected and undiscussed. In fact, various evidences confirm that these rever reverse migration continued till a very recent time but remained unrecorded in script. Reverse migration from Egypt remained undetected because there was little change in the physical features of the reverse migration fraternities. On the other hand, those who returned from Europe had a variable degree of Caucasoid physical features like fair complexion, tall stature, and light-colored iris, and thus they were easily noticed. Gongaridi, which was the ancient name of Bengal, played a 
crucial role in the spread of Indian fraternities to the rest of the world. An exploration of Hampi and other regions of southern peninsula of India as well as Sri Lanka in the south and Odisha, Bangladesh and Northeast India in the east provided me an idea about the sea route reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities. It was an exciting experience of my life as I gradually understood the reverse migration by sea. I realized that the Indian origin fraternities returned from the Red Sea region along this route and settled at various places on the west and east coast of India. The principal reason behind the reverse migration is the discomfort felt by the matriarchal Indian origin fraternities in Egypt and Europe as patriarchal culture emerged there. Thereafter, Emergence of religions like Christianity and Islam on the Mediterranean coast prompted the Indian origin Hindu community to return to their homeland India. Let me explain the background of the first reason. I have discussed in the previous episode, matriarchal fraternities originated and spread from the Bengal coastal, Bengal glacial coastal shelf. They spoke Indian languages and practiced Hinduism even in their distant settlements on the Mediterranean coast as well as in Egypt and ancient Greece. Over a period of time, as the patriarchal communities started dominating the region, Indian origin matriarchal communities started returning to India with their deities. Thus, we find a variety of Kali and Durga images emerging in India, including Durga. Similarly, we find Shama Kali, Dakhina Kali, Tara, Chundi, and so on, all various manifestations of Kali in India. Indian origin fraternities primarily returned because of the emergence of the patriarchal culture in Egypt and Europe. Now, let me explain the background of the second reason. In the last 2000 years, emergence of new religions like Christianity and Islam in the Eastern Mediterranean coast resulted in the Indian origin Hindu fraternities to return to India. They were worshippers of Devi, Vishnu as well as Shiva. They belonged to both matriarchal and patriarchal communities. The Indian origin fraternities also adopted Buddhism and thus it spread to various regions of Southeast Asia by the reverse migration Indian origin fraternities. Hence, we see that many Hindus and particularly Vishnu temples like Angkor Wat was constructed by the Hindu kings and were dedicated to Vishnu, but later used by the Buddhist as well. This is common. This is a common feature in India and Southeast Asia. We find a definite influence of Indian religion and culture in Southeast Asia, but it did not reach there directly from India. It reached there through the reverse migration Indian origin fraternities who arrived there by sea route from the Red Sea region. In fact, Buddhism also reached in Eastern Asia, including in China, Japan, and Mongolia, as the reverse migration Kirat fraternity reached there. As these reverse migration fraternities arrived from the Mediterranean coast, where uh, at a later date, Christianity and Islam emerged, they brought these influences as well. This reverse migration took place initially via the, via the land route along the Indus Valley Civilization and Uttarapath and later by sea route along the west and east coast of India all the way to Bay of Bengal and Northeast India. India is one of the most complex countries in the world in terms of ethnicity, culture and language. What makes India so diverse is little understood till date. A number of books have been published explaining various hypotheses regarding the origin of Indian population. Indians have been included very recently in global genetic studies. Some of the results are extremely confusing and remains unexplained so far. It is presently believed that the Indian population is the outcome of various fraternities migrating to India from different directions and this region served as a melting pot. They brought various languages and cultural characteristics which over time produced a unique blend of culture in India. Majority of the Indians today speak in Indo-European language which is believed to have come from Europe. Moreover, physical features resembling some European characteristics among a certain proportion of Indian population substantiated the hypo hypothesis of Indo-Aryan migration. Many scholars are of the opinion that even the Dravidian speakers native to the southern part of India came from other regions of India. Austroasiatics and Tibetan speakers are considered to have come from the east. 
Unfortunately, it is even believed that the arrival of Indo-Aryan fraternities from the West marked the beginning of a refined civilization in India. In other words, we are still in the dark about the origin of the Indian population. It is high time that on the basis of evidences, we seriously consider that Indian territories served as the intermediate host of the anatomical modern humans since their arrival from Africa 65,000 years ago. A gradual process of refinement of civilization continued in India. It had an indigenous population and a refined civilization since the last glacial period. They spread to distant lands starting from 12,000 years ago, following the submersion of the Bengal glacial coastal self. I shall discuss about their trans and migration path in a subsequent episode. They went with their skill, language, culture, and established Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egyptian, and European civilizations. At a later date, many of those Indian origin people came back to India for various reasons. Our aim today is to discuss the evidences of the Indian origin fraternities settling on the Mediterranean coast, Egypt, and Europe, and following their Indian culture there, and finally their reverse migration back to India. We have to incorporate scientific information which have emerged in the last couple of decades, especially in genetics and archaeology. To prepare the contents of the book, I have compiled information from all possible scientific sources as well as from our ancient texts like the Rig Veda. In the process, a completely new account of the possible pre-recorded period of India has emerged. In fact, Rig Veda provides clear description of the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities. Rig Veda is all about reverse migration of the patriarchal fraternities under the leadership of under the leadership of Indra, supported by Ogni, Surya, Bayu, Mitra, and others. They were possibly the leaders of various ethnic fraternities who adopted various animal symbols as their ethnic identities. Thus, each Rig Vedic deity has a Vahan, which we have discussed in previous episodes. In fact, I could identify the presence of many of those Rig Vedic deities in the Egyptian civilization like Surya, Ogni, Varun, Vayu, Ratri, and so on. Indra has white elephant Oirabot as his Vahun, suggesting that he was the deity of the elephant fraternity which came from a white territory or Turkey and Europe. Rig Veda is a subject by itself and I do not intend to go deeper into its contents at this stage. One thing is clear that Rig Veda is little understood even today because we are unable to decipher the codes that have been rampantly used in the Rig Veda. Incidentally, it mentions various animals almost in every Shukta. It mentions various colors of those animals, which apparently makes little sense. I have mentioned that it talks about Horitoshu or green horse and Lohitoshu or red horse, which do not exist in nature. Both animal symbols and color schemes are pre-script languages and we have discussed about them in previous episodes. Rig Veda is the most authentic recorded text about India. More importantly, it is accepted as the oldest scripture of the world by the global community. I decided to take on the challenge of reading the Rig Veda. I was most delighted to read the Bengali translation to begin with. I found that it actually mentions all the animal symbols we have mentioned and the color codes we have talked about. It also describes matriarchal and patriarchal territories. Finally, I thought it was actually describing the reverse migration of the Indian origin patriarchal fraternities. Eventually, I have immensely enjoyed going through the Rig Veda. There is a need to discuss about the contents of the Rig Veda. We rarely find any conference which exclusively discusses the Rig Veda. Then why am I considering this as my topic of discussion? First, it is an authentic document about the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities, which is our subject for this episode. Second, many of you will travel all over the world sooner or later. You will be the representatives of the Vedic civilization and culture. It is absolutely necessary that we know more about our holy scriptures. Now let us make an attempt to understand who were these people. 
whether they fit into our hypothesis of reverse migration. Similarly, who wrote Pali scriptures of Buddhism and Jainism? Who wrote Sanskrit texts and so on? These are ground evidences but are not discussed in our syllabus for whatever reasons. Unfortunately, we do not find scripted documents about every event, primarily because these events occurred during the pre-script period and hence no scripted material is available. At this juncture, you have to join me to explore every corner of the Indian subcontinent. These evidences are not available in the books at this juncture. They need to be searched on ground, documented and included in the books. Eventually, they need to be included in our academic curriculum. If required, new departments have to be opened to conduct research about these subjects. We Indians need to take interest because clearly Indian civilization is the oldest in the world. It is our responsibility to establish this and present it with scientific evidences which will be acceptable to, the, to everybody in the world. We have to take special interest because evidences suggest that newer genetic post-glacial period identities like R1 alpha and R1 bravo haplogroups in Y chromosome originated in the Bengal Myanmar coast. As the Bengal glacial coastal shelf or the BGC is submerged, the displaced population settled in Gongaridi region or ancient West Bengal. They adopted various animal symbols as their ethnic identity and managed to spread Indian languages and matriarchal culture as they traveled to distant lands, as I have discussed in previous episodes. Today, we are going to discuss about what are the evidences available in India to establish that at a later date, they actually came back to India for various reasons. Now, let me show you a video which explains the phenomena of reverse migration of Indian origin fraternities. In the second half of my book, I have discussed the evidences of reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities from Egypt by different routes and in different periods. It is apparent that the land route migration took place along the Uttarapod and the Indus Valley civilization. In fact, the mature period of the Indus Valley civilization, that is from 2600 BC to 1900 BC, perfectly coincides with the period of the land route reverse migration from Egypt. As such, IVC or Indus Valley civilization was located on the land route from India to Egypt. We find the emergence of the reverse migration animal symbols like the horse, boar, lion and peacock along the entire stretch of the Uttarapath. These animal symbols are found all over the subcontinent but their emergence in the Indian Himalayas, Nepal, Bhutan, Tibetan Plateau and Northeast India are striking as the species are mostly not found there. These regions are connected with Egypt and Europe through the Uttarapath. A number of ground evidences identify the migration paths along which both the onward and reverse migration had taken place. I have seen two friends sharing the ownership of a shop in Pokhara, Nepal. One gentleman was shot with brachycephalic features, which is possibly a typical feature of the indigenous Indians. In this case, the face is roundish with breadth more than 80% of the vertical height of the face. While his friend was not only tall, but also had an oligocephalic face, with width of the face less than 75% of the height. This is a typical feature of some parts of Europe. I have also seen Kali in the Kamala Shagar temple of Tripura draped in a white sari suggesting her reverse migration nature. A dramatic change occurred in the reverse migration path when a direct sea route between the Red Sea ports and the west coast of India was established around 1500 BC. This new land route was possibly referred to as Dokkinapath which joined Uttarapath near Mount Kailash. The Shodosho Mohajanapadas emerged along these two highways which were exclusively recorded in the Jain and Buddhist texts written in Pali. This suggested that these were settlements of the Pali speakers. Their absence in Sanskrit records exposes a rivalry between the Pali and Sanskrit speakers. In all probability, reverse migration fraternities from Europe were Sanskrit speakers and the reverse migration fraternities from Egypt were Pali and Prakrita speakers. At this juncture, as the reverse migration fraternities from Egypt came by ship directly to the west coast of India, 
Nobody traveled along the old land route via the Indus Valley Civilization, resulting in its silent collapse. As such, we could not find any cause for the collapse of the Indus Valley Civilization. As 16 Mahajanapadas emerged in northern India, it gave an impression that Indus Valley Civilization population had shifted to the Gangetic Plains. Over a period, the sea route from Red Sea got extended to the Bay of Bengal as the reverse migration fraternities from Egypt were keen to reach the matriarchal territories of Ganga Ridhi. The Prakrita speaking fraternities returned back to Bengal at this stage. The Egyptian deities Hathor and Isis created on the front facade of the Cairo Museum are associated with lotuses much like Lakshmi and Saraswati of the Indian pantheon. These images have striking similarities with the Sri or Lakshmi images of Chandra Ketugar, an archaeological site near Kolkata. Similarly, several terracotta artifacts of Chandra Ketugar have a pair of wings, a characteristic feature of Isis, the Egyptian manifestation of Sri. Ptolemy's map drawn at the beginning of the Christian era clearly shows five openings of river Ganga. In fact, we find a detailed description of the military powers of the king of Gangaridi in the notes of Greek and Roman scholars. It is possible that because the Egyptian people had spread from east coast of India, they had a compulsion to return to Gangaridi and Kiradesh marked as Kiradesh in the map. I wonder how a major event like the reverse migration of the Indian origin fraternities remained completely unnoticed and therefore undiscussed in academic forums. The concept of Indo-Aryan migration is often discussed, though it was considered as a primary migration from Europe to India and never as a reverse migration. On the other hand, any concept of reverse migration from Egypt is not known. At least, I have never heard any serious discussion about this subject. The people of Gangaridi region or ancient Bengal followed a matriarchal culture and worship goddesses since a long time ago. The residual effect is still palpable and often manifest culturally in the region. They collectively worship goddesses like Kali, Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Monasha, Jagodatri, Basanti and so on. I know many of them are known to the rest of the country, but a community collectively worshipping goddesses is something unique in the world. It is possible that these matriarchal culture prevailed in Bengal when Bengal glacial coastal self-submerged and people were bare-bodied. Thus, Bengal unhesitatingly worshipped their principal deity Kali in her original bare-bodied form, which is also unique in the world. In all probability, the concept of bare-bodied deity, deity emerged during a period when anatomical modern human lived a bare-bodied existence. However, she could not she could no longer remain bare-bodied when worshipped by Indian origin fraternities settled in distant lands. It is most likely that Mother Goddess Kali manifested as Black Athena in ancient Greece and Black Madonna in the rest of Europe. As the Indian origin fraternities settled there, these newer manifestations of Goddess Kali emerged in respective regions. Interestingly, when this reverse migration Indian origin fraternities returned, they worshipped Kali clad in red and white sarees depending on the region from where to these reverse migration fraternities had returned. Those who returned from red territory like the Red Sea region preferred their Kali in red sari as I have seen in Ramona Kali temple in Dhaka. Those who returned from the white territory or Europe preferred their Kali in a white sari like in Kamala Shagal Lake temple in Tripura. The Kali in Bengal quite faithfully has retained its original form. It took me many years to explore these regions and conceptualize that these are features of the reverse migration of Kali worshipping fraternities from distant lands. Similarly, when the lion fraternity worshipped Kali, they preferred to have lion as her bahan or associate. We find Durga as one of the most popular deities of in India, particularly of Bengal. We are aware that Mother Goddess Durga is another manifestation of Kali, although they, they look so different from one another. We consider Shiva as the consort of both Kali and Durga. When the reverse migration horse fraternity worship Durga, they prefer to depict their Durga mounted on a horse. When we go to Jhargram in Jungle Mohol, we find Konak Durga mounted on a horse. Durga, the warrior goddess of India, has a striking similarity with the warrior goddess of ancient Greece, Athena, as she is also associated with horse. In India, 
dark complexion goddess kali transformed into fair complexion goddess durga over a period of time a very similar thing happened in ancient greece as well there black athena gradually transformed into fair complexion athena possibly over a period of time as the population acquired fair complexion due to depigmentation athens the capital of ancient greece acquired its name from athena just as kolkata probably got its name from kali like the warrior goddess athena of greece the lion and horse fraternities worshiped warrior goddess durga and she acquired lion and horse as her associates please note that athena also has naga owl horse and avian as her associate very similar to durga mounted on lion with naga and avians like owl goose and peacock as vahuns of her children athena of greece and durga of india as well as konak durga of bengal have striking similarities similarly there is a strong resemblance between durga of india and sphinx of egypt as both these protected deities of respective territories have lion as inseparable associates in all probability lion fraternity promoted this warrior goddess in both these ancient civilizations as the indian origin fraternities continued to rule the egyptian civilization we find hori or vishnu manifesting as horus in the egyptian pantheon like our hori has a mythical eagle godura as his vahun horus has a similar mythical eagle as his associate this image was captured in front of the horus temple in edfu egypt this suggests that avian fraternity promoted hori and horus as their deity during the patriarchal period in india and egypt respectively this also suggests that indian origin fraternities continued to worship indian deities during their stay in distant civilizations till they returned to india it is observed that shiv manifested as zeb in the egyptian pantheon like the composite image of kali and shiv of india we find nut and zeb in a comparable posture moreover nut and zeb has two sons and two daughters quite comparable to that of shiv and durga of bengal furthermore shiv and zeb are phonetically quite close a number of shrines of middle east have been associated with shiva during my recent visit to petra in jordan a shrine has been referred to as a shiva shrine which clearly has a lingam as the deity these evidences are cultural evidences which can only be logically interpreted but cannot be scientifically established today there are genetic evidences which confirm onward and reverse migration of the indian origin fraternities which i shall discuss in some other episode Indian population have been divided into ancestral north indian and ancestral south indian in a, in a recent genetic study but there is little discussion on this issue to me it appears that they represent the pre and post glacial period population of india moreover it has been found that genetic identity of lower and higher kharkas population are quite close this also can be explained much better if we consider that reverse migration fraternity from europe established themselves as the higher caste people while indigenous population were downgraded as lower caste population let us now discuss about the cultural anthropological and linguistic evidences which we see all around but nobody explains these satisfactorily i have already discussed in the previous episode uploaded by sangam talks that various indian origin fraternities adopted different animal symbols as their site of origin and cultural characteristics but we find several other animal symbols which are not native to india like lion horse boar and so on these are reverse migration animal symbols adopted by indian origin fraternities during their stay in far away lands interestingly these animal symbols are also found in the himalayas where these species are not naturally found at all these symbols suggest reverse migration of various fraternities who adopted these animal symbols and they had traveled along the himalayan paths there has to be a reason for each of these cultural and folk art tendencies as we do not understand them we prefer not to talk about them on the anthropological front i have already discussed that indian origin people were initially dark complexion and had a roundish face referred to as brachycephalic face by the anthropologists similarly long face is referred to as oligocephalic face biraju shankar guho a bengali anthropologist trained in harvard and a global authority on anthropology of his time 
identified a fraternity in India and turned them as Western Brachycephali, who were round-faced but were fair complexion. Probably, as they were suspected to have come from the West, they were referred to as Western Brachycephali in his classification of Indian population based on anthropometric anthropology. They were detected in Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Bengal by him during 1931 census. But why are they found at such dissociated and distant territories of India remained a puzzle till date. This can only be explained with the logic that they were Indian origin reverse migration fraternities who had arrived from the Mediterranean coast and reached these distant territories along various reverse migration paths. Reverse migration of this fraternity took place when sea route was well established and thus they were found along the sea route extending from Gujarat to the Bay of Bengal. Interestingly, his authentic classification was published by the Oxford University Press in England and was well accepted by the Europeans in 1930s. They have been detected almost a century ago but has not been included in our syllabus and not discussed much and now completely forgotten. Possibly this is due to a tendency of Indians to follow the British way of thinking. It is extremely difficult for the British to seriously appreciate these ground evidences present exclusively in India. On the linguistic front, a very similar puzzle emerged, but to understand that process, we have to understand that during onward migration, Indian origin Pali and Prakita speaking fraternity settled in Palistan on the Mediterranean coast and on the Red Sea region marked as grey zone on the map. On the other hand, spoken Sanskrit speakers settled in Eastern Europe marked as yellow zone on the map. As the reverse migration Prakrita speaking fraternity from the Red Sea region returned on the west coast of India, they were detected in Maharashtra, Saurasena, now Mathura, Mogod and Bengal. These languages were identified as Marathi Prakrito, Saurasini Prakrito and Magodi Prakrito respectively. In fact, Vishnupriya Manipuri is also quite similar to Prakrito. Once again, they were detected in distant and dissociated territories and this remains a puzzle even today. This could also be explained that they settled at various sites along the reverse migration path. Another major linguistic observation is the emergence of 16 Mahajanapadas in northern India. These were established by the reverse migration Pali-speaking fraternities who returned from the Red Sea region by sea route. They were recorded in Buddhist and Jain scriptures written in Pali in 6th century BC. Hence, they were definitely Pali settlements. This change in the migration path resulted in the silent collapse of the Indus Valley civilization as I have mentioned in the video. During 3rd century BC, Pali was the ling language of majority of Indians and so Ashoka edicts were written in Pali. These are well-established cultural, linguistic and even historical evidences but are seldom included while arranging the events of our history. At this juncture, we have to understand the process of the reverse migration of Pali and Prakito speaking fraternities from the Red Sea region by sea route at an earlier date. They returned to the west coast of India and later along the Red Sea to the Bay of Bengal and Gangaridi region on the east coast of India. Thereafter, Sanskrit speaking for reverse migration fraternities arrived from Europe along the land route pivoting Mount Kailash. This is the background of rivalry between the Sanskrit and Pali speakers. Eventually, Sanskrit would become the dominant language with a large number of texts written in Sanskrit. Sanskrit texts took over at this stage, minimizing the Pali dominance among the indigenous Indians. They wrote rules for the society in Sanskrit, known as Sastra, and introduced caste system, known as Varna system in India. Moreover, after arrival, Sanskrit speakers managed to dominate the Indian subcontinent to such an extent that now we consider Sanskrit as the only source of information about ancient India. It appears that the Indo-Aryan invasion is disproportionately taking up a position of prime importance at present, while completely disregarding the possibility of existence of an extremely refined pre-Indo-Aryan culture in ancient India. This is possibly because they wrote a large number of Sanskrit texts which now serve as the primary source of information about ancient India. 
it is likely that even during the reverse migration period, three distinct indigenous communities lived in India. A matriarchal community in Ganga Ridhi on the east coast of India, Austroasiatic fraternities in East India, and Dravidians in Southern India. Each contributed equally in the present Indian culture, making it one of the richest cultures in the world. We need to decipher the prescript language like animal symbols and arrange various prehistorical events like glacial and interglacial periods, Andaman migration, onward and reverse migration, connectivity of India with both Egypt and Europe to understand the entire process. These different ethnic components of onward and reverse migration becomes apparent when one section worships Durga while the other component celebrates Navadurga at the same time known as Navaratri festival. Similarly, when one ethnic community celebrates the festival of Kali Puja in one part of the country, the other worships Lakshmi and the third celebrates victory of Rama over Asura on the same Dasera day. This also establishes the cyclic journey of the Indian deities and their various reverse migration manifestations. This also establishes onward migration of the matriarchal community with their goddesses and reverse migration of matriarchal and patriarchal communities with their deities. Interestingly, during Durga Puja, Bengal celebrates destruction of Asura by Durga while during the Dashera, Rama's victory over Asura Ravana is celebrated. Unless this major event of reverse migration process is appreciated, prehistorical events of India will not be understood at all. In fact, once we appreciate the presence of the indigenous Indian fraternities as well as reverse migration fraternities from both the Red Sea region and Europe and their mutual conflict in India, only then we will be able to identify each character and understand the events of Ramayana, Mahabharata and Rig Veda much better. Now let me show you a symbol, an interlocked double triangle that I saw in the Shokti Peet or Kali temple in Kathmandu. Here this symbol is associated with lotus. These possibly indicate that the symbol was used by the matriarchal and learned Kali worshipping community because lotus signifies wisdom and knowledge. I am discussing this particular symbol because it is possible to trace the journey of this symbol along the Indian origin, along with the Indian origin matriarchal community who migrated along the trans Himalayan migration route along river Kali Gandaki. Thereafter, emergence of this same symbol on the Mediterranean coast which is presently displayed on the national flag of Israel, and finally, reappearance of this symbol in the Buddhist shrines. I photographed a similar symbol in front of the library of Marfa village in north central Nepal. This implies that the fraternity traveled along this trans Himalayan migration path. Marfa is a Thakali community village located on the bank of Kali Gandaki river. This symbol is also visible in Buddhist shrines. It is associated with knowledge and adopted by the Buddhists as a sacred symbol. In all probability, this symbol was used by the Pali-speaking matriarchal learned Gojo fraternity. Here also it is associated with lotus. Their settlement on the Mediterranean coast was known as Palistan and Gojo. They are now known as Palestine and Gaza Strip respectively. Does it give an idea that an Indian origin matriarchal fraternity preferred to use this symbol which followed this trans Himalayan highway to reach the Mediterranean coast? The reverse migration fraternities from there used the same symbol as they returned to India and adopted Buddhism. Interestingly, almost a similar symbol of blue, blue double triangle is seen on the flag of Israel. This is known as David's triangle and Solomon's seal there but it is not known when and how the symbols surfaced there. There are a large number of evidences to establish that reverse migration Indian origin fraternities from the Mediterranean region had returned and settled in the Himalayas and Northeast India. I have dealt with this subject elaborately in my book. I would like to show you a short video on this subject. As I explored Northeastern states for six years, I was convinced that they had an ethnic connectivity with the Red Sea region. I have explained some of them in the video. I have been exploring Northeast India since 1975. 
As I extensively explored the seven states of Northeast India, I realized that the reverse migration fraternities had settled in the region since a very early period. During the land route migration period, they had come through the Uttarapath along river Brahmaputra in the north. Many of them had settled in the higher reaches of the Himalayas like Monpas of Tawang, while some others descended to the Brahmaputra valley constructing Ita Fort, Vishmaknagar and Rukmini Nagar forts and so on. Sea route reverse migration fraternities arrived later and settled in the region using two different routes. One fraternity who arrived from the Red Sea region to the Bay of Bengal ascended along the rivers of Bangladesh to settle in Assam, Meghalaya and Tripura. Thus we find ancient Greek art popularly known as Hellenistic art in the 6th century Dahapurbhutiya temple of Tejpur. In Koilashaho, Tripura, we find unusual huge rock cut images of Shiva in the Unokoti temple complex. Indian origin people had extraordinary skill in rock cutting and handling huge stone blocks. It is possible that they created obelisk in Egypt and Stonehenge in Europe 3000 to 5000 years ago. Following their reverse migration, they continued to create such unfathomable stone blocks in the Indian subcontinent as the skill was indigenous. Natyang monoliths of Meghalaya created till as late as 1883 are 8 meters tall and are quite comparable in dimension to that of the Stonehenge of England. In fact, the horizontal round plates about 1 feet thick are more difficult to cut but they are not known to the world. The reverse migration fraternities from Red Sea region entered the Northeast Indian states from the east also as they ascended along river Iravati and Chinwin. The Ahoms reached along this route in the 13th century. The ancestral memorials of Ahom in Choraidao are known as Maidems, which are miniature replicas of the pyramids of Egypt. In fact, the oldest Egyptian pyramids were also known as Maidems. The Hebrew name of Egypt is Mirzaim. Mizos had been given visa by Israel as they were considered to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. One of the oldest Egyptian documents, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, compiled at the beginning of the Christian era, mentions about the connectivity of the Red Sea and Northeast India. My extensive exploration of Northeast India provided me with definite evidences of its connectivity with the Red Sea region and Africa. I had to embark on an excursion to Egypt where to my surprise I found more evidences than I expected. Over a period, I could arrange the entire process of the onward migration of the Indian origin fraternities and their reverse migration back to India. This is the onward migration map to explain that Indian origin fraternities migrated to distant lands following various routes. They established ancient civilization in Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egypt and Greece long ago as discussed before. Imagine what happened when a large number of Indian origin fraternities returned to India during their reverse migration and very few Indian origin people were left in those regions to sustain those civilizations. As those civilizations were essentially maintained by the Indian origin people, as a result, they collapsed over a period of time. Interestingly, all the major ancient civilizations collapsed around more or less the same period time. In fact, the period when they collapsed provides an idea about the exact time when the Indian origin people withdrew from those locations. In this context, I can give a hypothetical example. Today, we find very advanced cities in Middle East like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, primarily in the Arabian countries, but they are all maintained by people from other countries. A large number of Indians work in the Arabian countries. Majority of the constructions have been constructed by outsourced people. If they are traveled there for any reason and all of them decide to leave, Arabian cities would collapse in no time. Then in 50 to 100 years, these cities would become abundant. The region would look like a collapsed civilization, very much like Egypt and Greece. This is, of course, my view. There has to be an explanation for each of these rather unusual observations. It is thus important that we make an attempt to understand the events of the pre-recorded period in relation to India. In fact, 
unless we form a clear idea about the pre-recorded period of India, it would not be possible to write our history correctly. If we, re if we rely on foreign rulers to record our history, it would obviously become a concocted one far from the truth. Thank you. Jai Hind. Sir, my question is, uh, what is the origin of these animal symbols? Actually, what we find is, these animal symbols originated pretty early. You know, my I'm convinced that during their stay, they, they stayed on the Bengal glacial coastal shelf for 10,000 years before it got submerged. And that got connected with Andaman. You know, it's, it's a long process during which this Bengal glacial coastal shelf existed. And during their stay there, already various ethnic fraternities had formed. You know, there were various groups or clans. And they had possibly adopted these animal symbols during their stay there. So when this, uh, when this landmass submerged in waves, they came to the mainland all right. But by then, they were divided into different ethnic fraternities and they had already adopted animal symbol. It is possible that those people who had come from, let us say, uh, southern India, they had adopted uh, ape or Hanuman as their ethnic identity. And so they joined these people all right. But these uh, different ethnic groups had already formed and they had adopted different animal symbols by then. Now, when they migrated to distant lands, it becomes very important for the Indians to, if we can manage to establish that these animal symbols originated in India and thus the migrating fraternities were establishing the footprints of each animal symbols along the migration path they followed. Like, as I mentioned, that we can actually follow the migration path of Bagh fraternity, Baghish tiger, from Baghdogra to Baghmati River to Baglan, Bagram in Afghanistan to Baghdad in Syria. And so we can trace the migration path. Similarly, Hathi fraternity also, we can trace the migration path of Hathi fraternity, fish fraternity or Masa fraternity, as we have discussed in the previous episodes. And now... Each fraternity during the matriarchal period and during the patriarchal period promoted a deity. Now, when a particular fraternity, let us say avian fraternity is promoting her deity, they want their deity to have their animal symbol as the associate. Now, when the lion fraternity is promoting a deity, then that deity, that is Durga, is having lion as the uh, associate. A, a very, uh, I mean, all these deities actually were promoted by some fraternity or other. And these, I, these animal symbols are giving us an idea that these were, these belong to, let us say, a matriarchal period. During the matriarchal period, the matriarchal avian fraternity promoted, let us say, Lokhi, Saraswati, so they have avian bahons. Whereas during patriarchal period, the avian fraternity promoted Vishnu. So we have Godur, uh, the avian Godur as the bahon of Vishnu or Hori. So that all, like, like during the matriarchal period, cow was the bahon of Parvati. And during the patriarchal period, bull becomes the bahun of Shiva. You know, so these animal symbols were used by a particular fraternity who promoted a particular deity. During the matriarchal period, they used a feminine species. And during the patriarchal period, they used the masculine species, you know, male uh, species. Thank you so much for a lovely presentation once again, sir. And we so look much. forward to uh, fourth part of this very interesting series with you, sir.